Uh, thank you so much for joining us at this year's Back to School Summit. I'm Sarah Bennis, and I am your current Shape America president. Shape America is so excited to be hosting this virtual event for the third year in a row. We know it's a really important and busy time of year as people are gearing themselves up for the school year. Many of us are probably still trying to hang on to summer as Cara and I were just talking about. Uh, so we're, we're really glad for you to be here and we're excited to be offering uh, this event tonight at no charge to any of our health education and physical education community. We really hope that you find this topic relevant and it's a, it's a perfect kind of um, thing to, for us all to be thinking about as we're heading into a new school year. It's also something that's really important to all of us in leadership positions at Shape America. Uh, inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion is embedded as a key priority for the organization in Shape America's new strategic direction. I strongly encourage you to check that out on our website if you have not seen it yet. Part of our commitment is related to equipping and empowering all health and physical educators to support each other in advancing EDI within the field and to providing all students with access and opportunity to be successful in physical education and health education. We are committed to serving as a leading source for strategies to bolster the recruitment of diverse health and physical education teachers, to empowering and equipping teachers so they can sex successfully create inclusive and equitable health and physical education learning opportunities. And we are committed to cultivating an equitable, inclusive organizational culture with diverse representation among our volunteer leadership community and staff. So really big goals that we have related to supporting our community as it relates to EDI. So tonight we are very excited um, for our program. As I mentioned, it's, it's a really timely offering um, and is aligned with where we hope to support our community. So we get to hear from experts like our very own uh, president-elect, Dr. Cara Grant. I hope you enjoy every minute of tonight's program. I'm super excited myself. Uh, please use the chat box as folks already are to offer up your own ideas, questions, or feedback. Um, and please also we encourage you to share your feedback on tonight's event. And just in general about how Shape America can do more and do better to advance inclusion in our classrooms so that all students have positive, joyful health education and physical physical education experiences. You'll be able to do that through a survey that we will be sending um, about tonight's event that will also include recordings of the sessions and that will all come to you via email next week. So thank you so much. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to our keynote speaker for this evening, Dr. Cara Grant. Thank you so much, Sarah. All right, everybody, it is time to go in and get in on this next topic. Um, Sarah, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? Awesome. All right, so for the next few uh, minutes, we're gonna be talking about developing a sense of belonging in health and physical education. Um, and as we go through these uh, particular items, we're going to look at uh, exploring social identities and the cycle of socialization. We're gonna review CDC youth risk behavior surveillance system data to investigate how that data is different by marginalized groups, and then use all of that information to create a sense of belonging in our health and PE classrooms. So anytime we have a topic like this, we really need to have some general agreements. And I know that we're webinar style, but as you sit in your place of receiving this message, you're going to be processing in different ways. So please feel comfortable to lean in, engage your thoughts, write them down. Um, if you're processing too much and not listening too much to what information is being shared and you're thinking about how to solve a problem, lean out and seek to listen to understand. Um, these can be used for your class or they can be used elsewhere, but speaking for yourself, don't try to speak for your group or using I statements. If you feel hurt by some, things someone says, say ouch, and let them know why. Uh, there is a level of trust. Um, I know with this being a webinar, confidentiality doesn't have as much. Um, so I'm being vulnerable and putting my story out there and I trust that you will respect my story. My perspective is my reality and this is my lived experience. Um, and then try to suspend your own beliefs and biases to hear my experiences. Uh, and if you were to have a place to go next, talk about the impact, not just the intent 
um, and so on. So the context for learning, in short, we have a country that supports um, at the legal higher up level, um, marginalized communities. Here's an example of how there is support of marginalized communities, LGBTQIA plus, um, as well as the CDC coming out even pre-pandemic that racism is a public health issue in our country. So as a result of that quick context, I'm gonna dive into something that's really helped me in my equity journey that I think might also help you. So I'm gonna model this strategy um, with the cycle of socialization, and I'm gonna go through this. But overall, Haro brought this um, into context because what we experience, how we are institutionally and like institutional structures, cultural structures, families, et cetera, they shape us, they influence us um, into who we are and how we become. So as a result, what does that look like? So my story, is that uh, where I'm coming from, I'm a health and PE and adaptive PE supervisor in a large school district serving uh, about 165,000 students, around 800 teachers. Um, it's a public school system. I attended private Christian school, pre-K to eight where my parents worked. Uh, my dad's first generation born in the country. His parents were born in Russia and Barbados. And my mom is um, not first generation in the country. She, her family's from upstate New York, uh, German, Pennsylvania, Dutch. So this is my experience modeling those, how the cycle of socialization would work through my life. So my parents, this is my grandfather. Uh, this is in New York City, this is my aunt. This is my grandmother, this is my dad, brother, sister. So you can see kind of like the age, uh, the races, uh, Russian Jew, Barbados, my mom's side of the family, my grandparents, uh, German, Pennsylvania, Dutch, upstate New York. Here's my parents, my dad and my mom. And um, for context, this is the loving family. And that was a court case to legalize interracial marriage that happened around the same time um, as my parents got married. So here's the actual day of my parents' wedding. There's my mom and dad, married at Justice of Peace in New York City. And then here's our family. Um, what you'll notice is early on, there's not a lot of pictures of my mom's side because they disowned her after she fell in love with my dad. And then here's my dad. So you can see even in the context of him going into military after he couldn't find a job as a PE teacher out of Brockport. Um, he went to PT school and you can see he's, um, race plays a factor in that. So all these things influence who I am and how I became and where my bias and belief systems lie. So even though I was raised Christian, my dad never let me forget about my Russian Jewish heritage. Um, my mom, practice traditional secular and religious belief systems and structures like Easter, uh, Christmas, um, celebrating birthdays as a family. And so that led me into like where I became, who I'm supposed to be, where I give my trust, what are my norms, what do I value? So that picture um, here is my dad and I at my first school. Down here, here's me and my dad. Uh, he was running a race. That was after he ran a race. Here's my first organized sports team, uh, St. Andrew's track team. Um, so this is like in the 80s and you can see even then it, it's uh, multicultural. Then here's a picture of myself in high school and my nephew. Um, I went to register for high school and uh, at the time, my sister was working, so I took my nephew with me into the counseling office, and I was registering, and the counselor's like, oh, is that your child? I was 14 years old, and they asked if my nephew was my child. So when you talk about the culture and how people perceive you, they were totally accepting of me to be pregnant as a 12, 13-year-old and have a child coming into freshman year. 
So how does that shape who you are? It, it shapes you in a very big way, very big way. Um, here I am in high school. My parents always had me in organized sports. Um, and then here's the father-daughter dance um, at school. So that strong family and belief system played a huge role. Um, but then how did religion and community play into that? Well, I went to a private Christian school. There's me at kindergarten graduation. Yep. And then uh, my family kept us in church seven days a week. We were there all the time, every night of the week, even on weekends. Um, and so that made me identify that there was one right way and one wrong way to do things. Um, what I didn't know is that they also kept me out of the neighborhood by being in church and sports because we weren't in a great neighborhood. There was a lot of Section 8 housing, but even more so as I got older, I found out there was a lot of crack houses, uh, stabbings, and uh, police presence in a negative way in my neighborhood. Um, I did take advantage of it by collecting the beer cans and getting money from them at the grocery store. So that was a, a benefit, but it was an interesting dynamic to grow up in. Um, and then when I got to the part about race uh, was uh, the first time I had to deal with the word race. It was, I was 10. So a little bit later from, for, from my friends that are also multicultural. And I remember I was registering for school and my dad was like, you got to fill out these forms. <laughs> you know, you're, you got to own this, right? So I was like, oh, I know my address. I know my name. I know all those things. And then I was like, what's this four letter word? What does that mean? And I look at my dad and he's like, put 50 yard dash if all you want. It doesn't matter. So he was kind of avoidant of addressing it. But I do think it stemmed from his own um identities and how they presented themselves and what he had to navigate as a young person growing up multicultural as well. So I got a lot of what are you instead of what's your name. And so that led me to be more reflective about my race or um races is a, a Latino uh, way to say that as well, the coming together. Um, that I learned about because a lot of people thought I was Hispanic or Latina. So I had to, I learned about that to, to know where I am and what I'm not in to give respect. So in context of the time period, that's when this movie Jungle Fever came out. So there was a lot of pop culture and media influences on what it looked like, what it meant to be black, to be multicultural in America. And it was still very much, if you have one drop of black in you, you are black. I don't care what color your skin is. If you're black, you're black. So all of those really influenced me into who I am, how I see myself fitting in, and how does that help me navigate the perception of the outside world into how I'm internalizing these truths and how am I supporting others? So as a result, this is my family. Um, it's my stepson, Isaiah. There's Mike. Bryce, Ruben, my dad, Ruben, my husband, and then one of our dogs, Peaches. And then here's my extended family. Uh, when I got my doctorate, my, um, my in-laws came through from New Jersey and New York. Um, so this practice I modeled, and I know I went through it very quickly, uh, was to get you to think, what is my journey? What is my experience with how I was raised geographically. How was my family working with me? What did the, what were those influences on how I identify around race, socialization into society? What were the norms and expectations they expected me as an individual, as a child, um, as someone that is female, someone that's multicultural, uh, which socioeconomic status? And then how does that translate into the students we're serving? Are their stories similar or different? How do we know what does that look like? And then how does that serve the greater communication and with your district? So with that, we're going to transition into going into the youth risk behavior surveillance system data. The YRBS data is amazing. I love this data because it doesn't 
oftentimes we say, oh, oh my goodness. Yeah, this is my perception. I think that kids are always late because of whatever, right? There was an accident or they just don't want to get up. They're all adolescents. They're going through puberty. They don't want to go to school. But what this does is it helps us get some more information about what it is that students are saying. It's self-reported data, how they perceive different health and physical education related topics. So this helps us inform our work to make decisions of where we need to put our energy and how this links to those socialization stories, how we can support marginalized groups of students um, and get the work moving forward in a positive trajectory for our students. So what I'm gonna do first is go through a sample health education model, and then I'll go through uh, a physical education type model that you can look at. So after the presentation is done, the slides will be sent out. You can get the quick links. In the quick links, you can look at the United States as a whole. You could take the United States and then pull out your state data. And then depending on your district, you can pull out your district data. So for this data review, there's a summary report. It does a longitudinal study from 2011, 2021, and it has a lag. So the data for 2023 won't come out for a couple um, of years. It takes about a year and a half for it to be released. So these topic areas, you can see sexual behavior, substance use, violence, uh, mental health are very closely linked to the work we do in providing students with health education. So here's some general findings. And so what we would do is say, well, how do these findings impact what we should emphasize more of in our health education curriculum and implementation? How does the cycle of socialization, your story, and then this is a sample of students saying what they're experiencing, what they're doing. How do those come together for us to better serve kids? So, for example, you know, condom use, uh, substance use is generally decreasing, but is still high. Violence are not declining, and in some cases, it's increasing. And mental health and suicidal thoughts is increasing. So we made a lot of assumptions that mental health was increasing. There are a lot of articles um, without research to support that. And then there were more with research post-COVID. But this is self-reported data from students saying, yes, they don't feel well. Um, so how can we help them? And then it disaggregates into marginalized groups of students. So for example, is saying it will go into LGBTQ plus and their rates and experiences as well. And then with this report for the health topic, it gave an example of what strategies you can use to have a positive trajectory to make changes. And of course, that's a quality health ed program that includes sexual health education. All right, so now we're gonna switch gears to a physical education related topic. Um, so what you'll do is when you go to this link here, it says, let's explore. These are all the different subtopics. When you click on one of these, it's going to pull up these icons, and then you can, you can navigate and explore what you want to do. And like I said, you can go to United States, and then you can go to your state. Like I saw Illinois. Um, I saw lots of <laughs> different states in the chat. So you can go click on those and get comparisons. So what I did is I picked physical activity. And then you can see these are the different topics, which are extremely aligned to our standards in physical education, uh, you know, valuing physical activity. Um, when you're talking about the fitness components, strength, muscular strength. So then I clicked on how active the students were on five or more days, and it disaggregate, disaggregates the data for us by gender and by race. And so then you can you can see 45% total here, female 35%, male 54%. Um, and then you can look at these trends and ask yourself, well, why? What do you see about this data? What do you notice about this data? How is it different for different subgroups? So with this subgroup, why would heterosexual straight students identify or mark 50% and others not? What questions does that pose to you about how to support students that 
may be out in identifying their um, sexual identity as not heterosexual or not, they're not comfortable coming out, but they're questioning. Um, so how does that impact students and what they're doing? So we just went through two samples of data use. Um, next we're gonna do is uh, kind of get you started with some planning ideas. Um, how can you take this data to the next level in your classroom? So uh, as an extension activity, you can watch this short video on mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. The questions and prompts you really need to ask yourself are, do students see themselves reflected in my tasks and materials, et cetera? You know, we have a lot of games and athletics happening. Do typical bodied students see themselves? You know, are different colored people present or do they all have the same skin color, whether that's black, white, light, whichever complexion? Do you only have one color students represented? Do you have only able-bodied students or do you have differently able-bodied students represented? Windows, are students able to see themselves and see into others' worlds? And then are they allowed or permitted to enter into that world as well? What activities in health and physical education do you do that permit students to experience, for example, the cycle of socialization? For me, you were able to experience some of what I went through and see my world. So how would that be reflected? Would that be a mirror? Would that be a window? Would that be a sliding glass door? For you, I don't know. That's a personal reflection for you based on how you identify with my experience or how it's different from your experience. Other considerations you may take moving forward. What are the curriculum materials that you're using? What are your instructional tasks? Go into that YRBS data and say, what is my local state or my local district data saying so that I can serve and support students in their strengths and their growth areas and how can I better prepare them for lifelong health and physical literacy? And by doing so, we're then able to help them navigate into a sense of belonging because by looking at your own personal cycle of socialization and saying, where are my students coming from? then how am I representing my students in my class? That helps foster the equity journey for yourself. And it lets your students and community know that you're trying to make sure that it is an inclusive place for all. So at this point, I wanna thank you for your time and consideration today. And you will receive these slides and extension materials as well for you to explore all the time. And as always, I'm here. I'm just an email away if you ever have any questions whatsoever. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your time and support and sharing my story uh, and sharing some resources. I'm super passionate about it. And it's not a right or wrong. I just always lean on the research and I lean on the data because my story, you can't tell me about my own story. I can't tell you about yours. And the students are telling their story through this data. So it's not our job to question it. It's our job to support students where they are, and that will help them build a better sense of belonging in our health and PE classes. Thanks, everybody.